Those of you that were listening to that run-up, that was Harvey Reich a year ago, uh, and things uh, have only gotten more confusing. We bring another scientist in today who is a cognitive scientist, Mark Chankizi, and uh, he will help us elucidate why there are such distortions, what happened to us. Uh, Caleb is particularly excited about today's show. He's pulled a bunch of Mark's tweets from four years, three years ago, four years ago, uh, where he was uh, already uh, ahead of the curve in terms of calling out what was going on at that time. Uh, Mark wrote uh, in March of 2020, the moral of coronavirus 19 will be that social contagion via social networks is more dangerous than the biological contagion itself. We'll explore that and more thoughts on what has happened to us after this. Our laws as it pertain to substances are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell do you think I learned that? I'm just saying, you go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it. I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. I suspect you've seen Susan and I gushing over Paleo Valley products. We love the taste and how well they fit into a paleo-based nutrition regimen. They're delicious and we use them for travel all the time. But there is more. We are huge fans as well of Paleo Valley's grass-fed bone broth protein. It comes in three flavors, unflavored, vanilla and chocolate. It's a powder you can add to really anything. We add it to coffee literally every day. Smoothies, baked dishes, or just hot water dissolves really easily. The bone broth protein is made with 100% grass-fed and finished bones that are free from pesticides or antibiotics and are slow simmered to extract as much collagen as possible. As we age, collagen breaks down. That's what wrinkles are. And research shows that there are significant benefits to adding a collagen source in your diet. I don't think it's too much to say it's changed our lives. And Susan is now reporting that after drinking the bone broth for a few weeks, her hair is stronger and longer and nails are stronger too try it for yourself you can order at drdrew.com slash paleo valley and use dr drew at checkout to save an additional 15 percent. i think everyone knows the next medical crisis could be just around the corner whether it comes in the form of another pandemic or something much more routine like a tick bite you and your family need to be prepared that's where the wellness company comes in you know the wellness company we have their physicians on like dr mccullough frequently the wellness company and their doctors are medical professionals you can trust and their new medical emergency kits are the gold standard when it comes to keeping you safe and healthy it's really it's a safety net it's an insurance policy yeah, absolutely that you hope you're not going to need but if you need it you sure as heck are going to wish you had it if you need it be ready for anything this medical emergency kit contains an assortment of life-saving medications including ivermectin z pack the medical emergency kit provides a guidebook to aid in the safe use of all these life-saving medications. From anthrax to tick bites to COVID-19, the wellness company's medical emergency kit is exactly what you need to have on hand to be prepared. Rest assured, knowing that you have emergency antibiotics, antivirals, and antiparasitics on hand to help you and your family stay safe from whatever life throws at you next. Go to drdrew.com slash TWC. That is D-R-D-R-E-W dot com forward slash TWC to get 10% off today. Just click on that link. So as I said, my guest today is Mark Chenk. He's a cognitive. Let's talk about that emergency kit. Oh, I talked about it yesterday. I, I really am excited about that kit. It's, it's particularly if you're somebody traveling. Uh, that is, this is exactly the, I wish I'd thought of some of the things in the kit when I send people off on the road, particularly if they're going uh, to Asia or Africa. This, this is an excellent combination that covers just about everything you could possibly need. Or if you can't get to a doctor or on a weekend or a holiday. It is an excellent Also, if you thing. go to uh, drdrew.com slash TWC, you'll also land on the natokinase page ah. if you need to update your your natokinase. Got it. I, I wish I'd uh, I wish I'd thought of that before, uh, that that kit, because it's just, it's just I, if I thought of something that I would prepare my patients with, it would look exactly like that. Speaking of which- Very exciting. Uh, speaking of uh, natokinase, I had another friend, I'm not going to say names just yet, but somebody you know, Susan- Another friend with a peripheral neuropathy uh, because of the vaccine. Oh, no, no. And uh, he has gone so far as going to Mayo Clinic. And uh, there they confirmed this is a vaccine injury, but we can't talk about it. Uh, 
So with that in mind, uh, let's bring Mark in here. Mark is a theoretical cognitive scientist. I'm going to read you his extraordinary pedigree. Uh, science, a founder of FreeX, he received degrees in physics and mathematics from UVA, PhD in math from University of Maryland. 2002, the Sloan Schwartz Award in theoretical neurobiology at Caltech author of multiple books, including Expressly Human, Decoding the Language of Motions. See him on Discovery Channel, Head Games, uh, National Geographic's Brain Games, more than three dozen scientific journal articles covering thousands of new newspaper and magazine articles as well. Mark, welcome to the program. Great to be here. Mark, am I pronouncing, let's get the, may get this out of the way right away. Am I pronouncing your last name correctly? Uh, Changizi. It's actually Genghis Khan. Chang it's the word for Genghis Khan. It's Persian for Genghis Khan, yeah. Okay, fair enough. I'm, I, I, I won't go down that road to hear what that's all about, but so be it. Uh, uh, no relation. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you heard me frame this conversation. I, I want to sort of maybe start out at a distance and, and come in to focus. Uh, you know, I was just before you came on, I was reading a headline by Mirlu Joost. Do you know who that is? Maybe did I get to him through you? Mm, he, um, no, I don't know. he was an early uh, writer about these uh, issues. Let me see. It was, it was a long time ago. He wrote The Rape of the Mind. Uh, he's a psychoanalyst, and uh, his whole thing was about mass formation and brainwashing, the rape of the mind. And he goes through so many of the, I mean, it looks to me like the first thorough run through uh, of what we've just been through. Uh, what have we been through? What happened to us? What set us up for this? How, do you, how did you know early and often that this was a problem? Yeah, I mean, I don't think there was necessarily uh, something that set set us up for it. You know, Desmet is often talking about that there are certain kinds of preconditions for uh, mass formation or you know mass hysteria, and, and I don't I don't think that anything needs to be specifically wrong or or, or some kind of state that has to be there. Um, this is just a kind of vir virality, and all of us are familiar with virality uh, in the sense that we're all on social media, and if you're on Twitter, you you know how it works, and it's very rare for your ideas to go viral. Um, it happens very, very rarely. Mostly, you have you know stuff that doesn't go anywhere, but every once in a while, one out of a thousand might suddenly be you know a million times uh, more impressions at other times, and uh, so. All of the time in, in societies, there are ideas that are being batted about, and PR companies and marketing companies are trying to be louder and get you know pick the right idea that will spread through. Um, but certain kinds of ideas are potentially more likely to spread through, and those are notions of infectiousness. You know, anything that's fearful generally, but things that are infectious, we have a particular uh, fear of that makes us want to react and shun. Uh, other humans, and it becomes a very uh, a socially divisive. It's sort of I call it the nuclear bomb uh, of societal destruction in some sense, because not only are you afraid. So, for example, if it was a bunch of locusts coming to the town, and we all had to, you know, fight the locusts because they're going to eat our fields, we would all band together and you know sort of you know kill the the locusts. Um, but when the threat is this invisible contagion that could be asymptomatically in him and her all around you, uh, it's utterly divisive and it taps in to sort of cooties instincts that we all have. Cooties, you know, for those that don't use that word anymore, cooties is the kind of thing that kids, when you're on the, you know, in elementary school, they say, oh, Judy's got cooties, run from cooties, you know, her, she's going to give you cooties. That's a very uh, uh, in ingrained notion that, that humans have. Um, something that's pussy on the ground, if you touch it, and it gets into your mouth or nose or maybe your eyes, you're infected. And once you're infected, it, it's, it's potentially life-changing. And so a lot of the intuitions that people have about COVID, which, which was a res respiratory virus, and it floats in the air and like an aerosol, uh, a lot of our intuitions for why we did what we did were driven by our instincts for goopy, like cootie stuff, right? Masks yep. work for goopy. Goodies like stuff, right? And so that's and so yeah. uh, 
that's the, the people's intuitions that has to block that kind of thing, for example. And and they because so they I, don't I, know about yeah. the engine the engineering of aerosols, that's that's something invisible and not something that plays out that that more primitive emotion. Right. So we don't have any good intuitions instinctually with this idea that are these just floating aerosols that can hang in the room for a couple of days. Um, we don't have any instincts for that at all. So people, no matter how many times you explain to them, they feel as if putting something over their mouth and nose or being separated two meters, well, that's sensible. Goop pretty much isn't going to hit you if you're about two meters away. Uh, so I have this, you know, in my Science Moment series at YouTube and at Bean Rumble, I have this sort of 20 minute video where I walk through dozen, a couple dozen kinds of intuitive, crazy beliefs COVID cult has that all sort of follow from these kinds of intuitions, instinctual intuitions about goopy cooties like stuff, but don't in fact apply to the actual scenario with a respiratory virus. So I, I, I certainly get the instinct around infectivity and disgust. Those are extremely powerful. Really, you, you, you've used, you used three different words. You said feeling, intuition, and emotion. And those are, I think, three different things, but they do kind of overlap in the sense that it is a very primitive, deep sort of a reactivity that's automated, automatic, comes out of our body. We pull away. We are disgusted. We you know, change our, our locomotion, quite literally, in response to things like like infecting agents that makes sense to me however but it, it, well and, 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 and there, go I, ahead i'll let you fall but the reason i was going to say, whenever there are uh, righteous communities that for which out groups of all people that are not in on the community they're against uh, that community they don't believe in it or they're deniers or whatever it might be um invariably the the um what the community selects for in terms of how to think about the outgroup is that infectious metaphors end up being selected for in that community. Those are the things that yeah. work in terms of making them further out, outing the outgroup even further, making sure that people don't even hang out with them. They further distance them. Um, so if you're not wearing your headscarf right in Iran, uh, you are treated as potentially infectious to society. You are a whore, and your kind of behavior is going to infect the men and the women, and society is going to you know, spiral downhill. If Jews in Nazi Germany were, the metaphors about Jews were steeped in infectious and virus and bacterial kinds of talk, right? Always dirty. selected for all of this kind of dirty, unclean, infectious gets selected for the yeah. middle class, upper middle class educated people in the Cultural Revolution in China the same way. Um, it always ends up, in this case, it happened to be a, a, a virus or a perceived altogether novel, disproportionately dangerous virus, but that in some sense is, was irrelevant. What was relevant was that there were some who stood up and said, look, I don't think this is altogether novel and disproportionately dangerous. You're a denier, right? You were suddenly a denier, right. and then the notion of who was in the out group changed over time. The anti-vaxxers or anybody who argued against the mandates mm -hmm. uh, over time became uh, uh, those in the out group, but the in group would evolve certain kinds of notions of how to think about them. And of course, infectiousness, of course, happens even when there's nothing infectious. So of course it happens when there actually is potentially something infectious. Yeah, when I think about uh, words like sin, they're just sort of these sort of large brushes to paint over somebody bad. But when you start talking about a denier, they are impure. They're not. They're not uh, a believer. They're. They're. In, they're somehow adulterated. Words like that come in very quickly. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, Caleb, put that up there. What you just wrote. What you just put up. That Mark had written in a tweet uh, a couple three years ago. Lockdowns were not common sense. They were hysterical reactions out of fear. You, this is another word we're using now with hysteria. Is that something you want to defend, or is that all the same thing? Well. It, what hysteria in this context, it, it means mass hysteria. It means group or collective irrationality. The individuals in a mass hysteria are not hysterical. In a mass psychosis, collective psychosis, they're not psychotic. The whole point of putting the word mass or group or collective in front is that the, the hystericalness, you know, or the psychosis or the, the craziness comes at the level of the group. Individually, you can argue with any of these individuals all day long, and there's nothing wrong with their brains. They're super rational. They will argue in you in circles, right? They just forever, they're going to argue around and around. You're not going to get anywhere because their brains are perfectly fine. The 
illness is at the level of the group. What happens when there are, and this is as a cognitive scientist, but I'm, my background is sort of emergent systems, complex phenomena. Uh, and, and as a physicist mathematician, we get good at understanding selection processes as how large scale networks select for certain kinds of things or evolve to have certain kinds of structures over time. And so, you know, that's the kind of uh, uh, way that I approach all of these sorts of things. But let me just pause there so, so don't keep going. <laughs> well, well, I, I, you, you brought up a large topic of emergent symptoms. So, so this was an emergent phenomenon, this hysteria, this mass formation, so to speak, right? It was. Yeah. So, I mean, e there, there was a certainly, a, yeah, it was, a, there was a little bit of fear in the beginning, but it's not like they're running around panicked, screaming the entire time. But what happens is that in under normal circumstances, I sit in my network of social relations of various kinds. Some of my social relations in the, in the relevant sense is Dr. Drew on TV, who I didn't used to know. And, and some of them are actual people that I know. And I kind of get independent judgments from those folks. And so 99.99% .99 of what I believe, I believe on the basis of the higher reputation folks around me saying stuff, right? As a scientist, maybe I've got 15 things that I know because I actually did the t-test or the statistical. Analysis. The rest I know, just like everybody else, because I was told by high reputation folks or by varieties of in seemingly independent high reputation folks in my network. But when something like this occurs and it becomes super viral, and suddenly I'm hearing something extremely strange, uh, and it doesn't just happen at once, it happens slowly. Well, this is super dangerous. Well, I think it's all together. And it all starts to beat as one, and you can suddenly hear something that's in the app. Were it not that 400 of your high reputation contacts were saying it, you would never believe it. But now you seemingly have all of these independent judgments from high reputation people saying something utterly crazy, but you're going to believe it. And I would have believed that if I would, was sitting in the network, I've always sort of maintained a level of aloofness because as a scientist and a theorist, I'm always wanting to remain aloof. So I'm not caught up in these sorts of minor or major hysterias. So that was one potential reason why I think I was insulated. But I would definitely have believed, just like everybody else believed, that it was altogether novel. And every single thing that we always understood about respiratory viruses was thrown out the window. It was as if we had zero prior or a complete uniform baseline on all of the knowledge that we ever have in terms of seasonality. What seasonality? No, COVID doesn't have any seasonality. It can hit you at any time. Uh, does it harm pretty much old people? No, e everybody's equally at risk. Every single thing that we knew about respiratory viruses, about flu and, bi and, and coronaviruses was presumed to not be known anymore. And once you're in a situation like that, you will start to believe things that you wouldn't otherwise believe, right? And it might take years and years to develop the same kind of uh, uh, confidence in hypotheses that you should have believed from the beginning. And yet that kind of thing continues until this day. Uh, as yeah. well as a fear of anyone popping up and wanting to examine things. I, I, it does not feel like the same thing as an emergent, uh, I'm thinking about fireflies that start to, you know, light up together, you know, these emergent properties that occur in nature. Right. It, it doesn't feel like that. It has, it has a weird artificial feel to it, like as though there's some authority structure in it that that these people have gotten caught up in and are the little army that act out on anyone who is uh impure denier sinful whatever those words are right well i mean they they, they definitely do but you don't need a centralized cabal to explain this in in social networks like this narratives form over time in some sense if you imagine that you're in, in fact it's a lot like blockchain blockchain is a very technical sounding thing but it's the way that cryptocurrency bitcoin works. Bit, the whole point of Bitcoin is that uh, there is no centralized uh, uh, ledger or list saying that, hey, you know, Mark just gave Bitcoin to Dr. Drew. Uh, it's not any, in any centralized list. It's in, instead, it's distributed across the network so that I can't say, no, I never gave anything to Dr. Drew, but it's distributed in such a way in the mines or in the computers you know, across the world. The same thing happens for social reputation. When people are struggling with this new kinds of idea like COVID is altogether novel, disproportionately dangerous. These things, uh, and all the time this is happening, not just in these, not just in these uh, mass hysterias. This week, amongst your friends, maybe Doug got into an argument with Judy and Doug was being a real douchebag. And then it'll spread around. Yeah, Doug was being a real douche. It turns out Judy was right. So what a jerk, you know, Doug was a real jerk, right? That'll get added. And then it'll be sort of 
And that's just like Doug, because Doug is only always doing that. And then it'll be added, this piece of sort of new gossip to the existing history of gossip about how Doug and Judy typically behave in the environment. And so that record of Doug losing social reputation and potentially Judy raising in social reputation because of that interaction is spread across the community in all of our heads because we are all keeping track of the gossip. So, and in fact, it's really hard to change that history in the same way as that blockchain is, is impossible to fake. And I won't get into the mathematical details, but it has a lot of the same properties for why you can't go back and create a new blockchain claiming that everybody gave me a Bitcoin. You can't do that because one, it's in the heads of everybody, so it's distributed. And two, there's these mathematical properties that make it impossible to create a new story that explains all of the other stuff is, is computationally too hard. So once these narratives happen, they are almost impossible to displace. And on the one hand, that's good because you want, to, you want the networks to keep track of who is high reputation and who's low. Otherwise, free expression wouldn't work. The way the free expression works in terms, of, in terms of us slowly moving over time towards the truth is that the network keeps track of who's typically saying smart things and who's typically saying dumb things. And that allows these different reputations to rise and fall. And it's distributed and decentralized. But the downside is that if it absorbs or creates a really, you know, suite of really irrational ideas, those irrational ideas will hang around potentially until the next generation displaces them. The next generation. So are we well, stuck with some of these? Well, <laughs> um, certainly that happens wow. in science all the time, right? You're just waiting for the guys and the gals yeah. to die before the revolution can happen. Yeah, yeah that, that is true. Speaking of science, th that always has been, to me, the other buffer against these sorts of phenomena, right? As you said, you yourself try to stay above it use rational thought, use scientific methodology, uh, looking at the numbers even if you have them. And th as you said, everything got thrown out of the, out the window. All priors got there. It's, it's like a complete absence of any Bayesian thought process, complete absence from history and knowledge, and a large body of people that are engaging in this distributed reaction, I guess we would call it, that have no ability that seem to not understand the scientific methodology and how that works. So they, they have deep faith in their biases and deep faith in this distributed information. Is that all accurate? Uh, yeah, but it's not because they're suddenly reasoning differently. It really was the case that suddenly from, you know, March of 2020 to July, there was probably 100 uh, observational studies that appeared out of nowhere, so to speak, saying that masks worked, right? Really crappy, poorly done observational studies um, everywhere crop popping up, suddenly justifying why masks uh, suddenly were the science, even though they weren't before. And the, the problem is that, and so in the normal sense, they're able to look at, hey, the studies show this, at least the observational studies show this, which is how we all typically argue things. But what's the deeper thing that's going on is that in March, in April, when almost nobody was wearing masks, right? It wasn't even advised by team COVID. If you were a true uh, sort of COVID zero sort of person, zero COVID sort of person, you might be masking, right? Virtue si membership signals within a righteous community work when they're either some arbitrary weird thing that you can show or, or, or say or display, it has to be arbitrary because you don't want people to act, other people to accidentally be doing it, and, or it has to be a little bit irrational because or, or annoying or something about it that otherwise everybody would just do it if it was a good idea, right? So it served as a really good membership signal. Those that wore masks were displaying, I care, I care more than all the other people who aren't wearing it, right? So first, and so over time, it starts to be spreading as a good membership signal. I'm a good person. I'm a good person. But it doesn't typically stop there. Once you have a membership signals for a, a righteous community, people will start coming up with justifications for why those membership signals aren't just membership signals, but they themselves are good, virtuous, helpful. Um, this happens even for like, you know, simple things like simple groups in a city. They, you might have the Lululemon ladies in one part of town that just wear Lululemons when they go out. They kind of are sort of slightly nicer than sweatpants kind of look. And then you've got other parts of town where they always dress up and they do their nails and they're always looking like they're going out. And each one has negative say, things to say about the other community. And they often, and, and at first it just starts as a membership signal. Well, that's, you know, she's Lululemon, she lives in that neighborhood. 
but it never, and I, you know, we're the, and so the Lululemon girls, ladies will say, start to come up with just, and the magazines will say, well, it's actually a lot better for your skin. You wear those because you can breathe more. And then there's suddenly there'll be narratives will include not just that it distinguishes these two groups, but the things that distinguish them will be justified or selected for ideas that people come up with that justify why it's not a mere membership signal, but, but it's actually a sign of being good will get selected for and spread through the crowd and become believed. And there'll be good arguments typically, pretty good arguments, because otherwise they wouldn't spread very well. They'll be reasonably arguments. They're not going to be terrible. That's what happened you know, across the earth in terms of masks and how masks went from bunk to the science in just two months. To understand all these processes, you really have to understand these kinds of psycho-societal dynamics is my claim since the start. Do you make anything of this? You mentioned something that I, I've made note of too, this, the I care thing. I, I understand that it's a signal for I'm good, but this is the first time I've seen grandiose caring as, as a something, as a label that was constantly brought up about somebody who is in the in-group. I mean, are you sure? Like, uh, we're pretty close in age. Our whole life, you know, I'm a libertarian. My whole life was arguing to the extent that I engaged in political arguments. It was mostly with socialists. And socialists are constantly saying how they're better than me, how they care more than me. It's the standard, um, you know, so we, we should be used to this, right? You know what? So, so it might be that we have, we don't have not historically had a lot of socialists here. And you're right. We do have a lot now. And that, that may be as simple as that, that it's some sort of, epiphenomenon related to that movement really well i, I mean I, I i'm not i'm i'm fairly convinced that every righteous movement um usually comes up with uh, narratives that suggest that their behaviors and actions are such that um the society as they understand it is better off whole pot as he was you know s uh, emptying the cities and sending them out to the villages and two million people died or whatever in, in just a few you know a very short period of time believed he was creating, he believed he cared more. He cared so much that he was going to do such extreme things to show how much he cared. I think all of these things are going to have uh, notions and just justified on the basis of how much they care more than you. These things have been a recurring phenomenon through history, have they not? Yeah, this is just another case, but the difference is uh, we were connected to the internet one whole earth. So it suddenly became spread um, everywhere. Would you be willing to take a couple calls if people are interested in asking you questions? Yeah. All right. Let's do this. I still have some more questions. I, I want to talk a little more on the, the freedom front a little bit with you. And I also want to uh, dig into something you glossed over very quickly. Just if you can give us a little more on uh you were talking about emergent phenomenon and how it's computation no you were talking about um bitcoin and how it's computationally too hard to describe why a new system can't emerge i i was just a little curious about that if we can do a little sketch on that to help us understand that a little better does that sound okay are you you're saying right now or are you, you're gonna say there's a, someone no, that's when about I get to back. ask a question we're, related oh yes sure we're gonna take a break we're gonna take a break i'm gonna have you do that when we get back and then we'll take questions all right, be right back up to this. I want to share with you a teeth whitening system that goes beyond merely enhancing your smile. Primal Life Organics Real White Teeth Whitening System offers convenience and rapid results without harsh chemicals. Light, blue light for whitening, red light for gum and oral hygiene, and you can just do both if you wish. Works naturally, promoting gum healing, tooth remineralization, gives you a brighter and a healthier smile. Again, no peroxide involved. Consistent usage yields remarkable results. Take this opportunity to transform your smile and at the same time, optimize your oral health. Aim for five times a week for the best outcomes. Discover more about this remarkable teeth whitening system and other products at drdrew.com slash primal today. That again is drdrew.com slash P-R-I-M-A-L. Be sure to use that link for 60% off drdrew.com slash P-R-I-M-A-L. Do it today for 60% off. There are three steps to great looking glowing complexion in the summer. 
of course, apply sunscreen, stay hydrated, and use the amazing skincare products from our friends at Genucel. Most retinol creams are not recommended for sunlight, but Genucel's Ultra Retinol uses a powerful plant extract retinol. It's an alternative called Bacuchiol which helps the skin stay hydrated, smooths out fine lines without harsh side effects. And it is safe to use outside under your sunscreen. Genucel works so well, you can see the results in this unplanned live moment on our show when the Redness Repair Cream repaired my skin in just minutes right before your eyes. And Susan and I love Genucel so much, we created our affordable bundles at up to 72% off of our favorite products at genucel.com slash drew and just for the summer every subscription includes a customized summer spa gift box absolutely free i know i'm a snob about the products i use on my face everybody knows it every time i go to the dermatologist's office they're just rows and rows of different creams and then when i get to the counter they're overpriced all kinds of products that you can all find at genucel.com see what's in our bundles get ready to show off your summertime skin go to genucel.com slash drew that's g-e-n-u-c-e-l.com slash d-r-e-w genucel.com slash drew and remember to use the code drew at checkout for extra savings temperatures are soaring across the country but do not lose sleep over the record-breaking heat say goodbye to hot restless nights with soft breathable temperature regulating bedding from cozy earth susan and i love them we were so excited to tell you about them in fact we have them on our bed right now and the cozy earth sheets made such a difference we got back from our trip and but like delighted to have these sheets they're made from super soft viscous from bamboo that are, helps regulate temperatures and keeps us comfortable all night long plus they're durable machine washable come with a 10-year warranty against defects it's no surprise that Cozy Earth's brands has been featured on Oprah's favorite things for five years in a row. They are now one of my favorite things, too. I want you to try these out for yourself. I am excited about a special deal that Cozy Earth is offering on our show today. My audience can save 40% on Cozy Earth bedding today. Just go to CozyEarth.com, enter our promo code Drew at checkout, and you will save 40% right now. Try them for 100 nights. If you don't sleep cooler and love them, send it back for a full refund that is C-O-Z-Y-E-A-R-T-H dot com, promo code D-R-E-W. Speaking of Primal Life, just before the uh, mics heated up, Susan gave me a birthday present. My, she stole my Sonic toothbrush, and she just replaced it with a birthday present. I appreciate that. I, I, Happy birthday. Yeah, you paid a fortune for one that I traveled with that I don't like nearly as much <laughs> as this one. So thank you for this one. You know what, um, what's cool about this is they don't get all gucky because mm-hmm. the ones, the Sonic Cares, you know, they mm-hmm. get all full of gu- It's got a smooth brush, and it doesn't get all caked up. Mm-hmm. That's what I love about it. I have not. And also, had, the brush is really cool. I, I like made out of charcoal brushes. Or yes, something. it's lovely. And I, I would, I wouldn't know about the getting caked up because somebody stole mine. <laughs> I never had a chance to find out if that's how it works. I also like their tongue scraper. Before we uh, bring Mark back, I want to remind people that are listening to the Twitter Spaces that uh, you can uh, raise your hand, and I'll bring you up. I see some requests for uh, questions there, and uh, make sure you mute the unmute the microphone in the lower left hand corner of your uh, screen. But just raise your hand. You push the uh, mic button there to be seen, and there here's a little uh, Caleb's cartoon about how this works. Um, so, Mark, uh, before, before the you, break, yeah. we were talking about. Yeah. Go ahead. You I want to say something. Go ahead. Well, I was going. There was something that you had mentioned earlier, earlier, and I I thought it might be more interesting to talk about, or at least to mention. You said it's important that we stay evidence based and and behave like scientists on this, and I, you know I've struggled with that. Of course, I've I've often argued against uh, against the supposed science on masks, saying like they don't work, the lockdowns wouldn't work. That that one of the things you showed was this fifteen uh, you know, sort of tweet thread, and arguing against the science that was put forth, but. Here's the problem with that. The problem is that suppose that suddenly next week they come up with a mask that actually works, right? Then I've spent, all of us have spent three years arguing that masks don't work and we were right, but then suddenly they come up with a mask that works and they go, okay, now what's your counter argument? Now we could still say, well, there's still all these downsides and you haven't done a full cost benefit analysis. They go, aha, we have done a cost benefit analysis and it turns out, and they've just, they've dotted their T's and they've done everything. They've handled 25 possible downsides and they've handled it all. Now, what are you going to say then? The answer- I'm going to say wear masks. That, I'm going to say wear a mask. Say, that's right. And they, said, they, they will say- That's what I'm going to say. That's right. Well, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that. So my argument is like, no, I, I'm, I'm not going to wear a mask because 
you don't have the right to tell me to cover up my face. We have civil liberties and it is up for individuals. It, just because you believe there's a perceived emergency doesn't justify you violating civil liberties in mass. And if you start uh. down the path of just poking holes in their evidence, then if suddenly they can actually get good evidence for these new draconian interventions justified by yeah. perceived emergencies, well, you've implicitly, in some sense, admitted that it would be okay. And my main driver that I've, I mean, in addition to arguing sort of the psycho societal phenomena, is that, no, what matters, so back to Pol Pot. I could have argued at the time to Pol Pot, who's emptying the, the, the cities and sending people out to villages, I could say, uh, Pol Pot, I had a whole group of folks, and we did a cost-benefit analysis about whether this is, in fact, good for society based on even your standards or our shared standards. And, in fact, it will actually be worse. There's going to be more, you know, uh, whatever. And it's going to be much, much, much worse. And we did all of these careful RCTs to ensure that, no, none of that matters, right? You don't have the right, Mr. Pot, to empty the cities for your ingenious scheme to save uh, the world, right? Same is true for all of these. And so I, my, I, I often think the central point has to be that emergencies don't justify civil liberties violations. Civil liberties are for the emergencies. It's just like free speech. When people talk about free speech, okay, you should have free speech except when people start saying things you don't like. No, that's exactly why yeah. we have free speech. We have civil liberties. We have the freedom to do certain kinds of things that we're all free to do, not when no one gives a crap that I'm doing them. What matters is when suddenly someone has some claim that, oh, they're violating the good, that's when civil liberties matter. And that's when the card is brought out saying, no, I've got this civil liberties. Otherwise, it doesn't matter because no one's ever questioning my civil liberties. They're only questioning it when there are perceived emergencies. And so we have to take away this notion that emergencies justify civil liberties violations, because not only are they for the emergencies, our greatest emergencies are civil liberties violations, right? There are no greater emergencies that have occurred throughout history than when governments claim that we have to violate civil, civil liberties in mass. That is the, the that is quickly a couple steps later is how you get crimes against humanity and democides and genocides. And it's a positive feedback loop. Once they start violating civil liberties in mass, well, they invariably mess things up and cause emergencies, real emergencies, right? Which justifies violating civil mm -hmm. liberties in mass. And so, you know, it's a positive feedback loop, right? And finally, just on this thing, you so, don't even have to concoct yeah. em em emergencies. Emergencies are always there. There's always some bloke or some gal some four blokes or gals that need your four healthy organs. Metaphorically, at all times, there are real emergencies. The government doesn't have to s concoct one. They're always there in that sense. Hi. What's that, Caleb? Is that you? I have, a, I have a question that's actually related to that. I actually have a lot of questions if you have a chance for me to ask. But it's but related let, to Let me just said. very quickly. Yeah. yeah, I will give that to you in one second. Like, it's just that we we have now. I feel like we've gone to a different topic or landscape of topics, which is essentially philosophical, for which there may be evidence, but it's sort of at its core philosophical. Which is that none of this matters if these core philosophical phenomenon are aren't respected or are violated, and and you can justify that by looking at history. But we're really, aren't we now talking philosophy at this point? Uh, I mean, we are certainly. One can still take the viewpoint that although these civil liberties violations wouldn't be justified, once a government decides here's the best thing that we can do and what makes somebody smart, if you're public policy folks, is not, hey, let's see if we can mandate people to do this. Let's force them at gunpoint to do that. No, the question is what kinds of incentives or what kinds of structure or what kinds of things can we have people voluntarily do that will tend sure. to lead yeah. to the kinds of processes? Those are the, where clever people are needed, right? Not just saying, yes. hey, let's force people yes. to do this. Right. I mean, that's where we always were. I mean, I, I listen, I was very active during the AIDS pandemic and we had a clear discipline about how to change these very difficult to change behaviors. Uh, we had a relatable source. We had uh, cases, you know, people telling their story where they made the wrong choice. Music, humor, narratives, relatable sources that change health behavior, particularly of young people. Difficult to change group, difficult behavior to change. That was one of the many things we threw out the window when we arrived at the coronavirus pandemic. Suddenly, 
coercion and mandate became the way you change people's behavior, which was shocking to any of us that have worked in changing health behaviors. Caleb, you want to ask a question? Yes. Yeah. So this this is kind of connected to the same topic that you guys are talking about right now. I was just thinking about one of the uh, prevailing theories that's happening right now about the pandemic is that somehow the pandemic itself is connected to this belief in a like a cabal cult of global elites who know or at least assume that they know something about overpopulation's threat to humanity that they believe would be too terrifying to reveal to the rest of us. And so the idea with this theory is that these people are so convinced that in order to save humankind that they must cull our numbers with these mass death events that wipe out the old and the sick and then upgrade the survivors with the, mRNA to save the species, right? Let's call this the... Let's call this the Oyve theory. Right, exactly. And, and is there <laughs> it, it's it's, and, it's uh, growing and, because it's it's a way of explaining I've heard versions of this including right. I know, and it's 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 again, it's paranoid, but but right. the, it's also heard as a corollary to that. People go, well, the mRNA vaccine is a way of testing who is pliable, who who we can, you know, right. who we actually will be able to get to comply with our wishes. But go ahead, Mark, you can address. right. Well, so but but my question is that let's and I hate hypotheticals, but like if we are assuming, let's assume for a minute that that's true. Would these people have any ethical standing at all to keep the rest of us in the dark about what's really happening if they're convinced this is the only way to save humanity? They, there's no way they're so, going to so convince everybody lightly. So now they have to trick us, basically. Why don't are we ask the different, a, the different more? <laughs> Go ahead. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, it, you're asking, suppose it's true, which I don't at all think it's true. I think it's, it's totally not. You're saying that then would we have what the ethical, the are they ethically justified? Are you claiming, or what, what was the question? Right, that's that's my question because I, it, it's hard for me to wrap my head around a lot of the details of this. If everyone is con like for the group of people that are convinced this was intentional, this wasn't from nature. That there's an intentional thing happening. The fastest and and seems like the most efficient way of solving it is there's a group of people that know something bad is coming and they're doing this for a reason and about overpopulation. Okay, hold they've on, been talking hold about on. that for decades. This is Mark. This is goes right at your witch hunt phenomenon. <laughs> So, you, you know, he has a whole thing about this. Go, go ahead and describe yeah. where witches come from. Oh, um, I, I'm not sure. Just to be clear, what are you referring to? Because there's sort of there's that doesn't uniquely determine Me? where I'm. Yeah, I've seen you. I've seen you do videos where you talk about when people are scared and uh, people look around for something to explain what's happening, to control it, okay, just to, to make sense right. of it. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And, and this is also even where. Uh, I think the notion of a devil, even itself, it, it read as there's two kinds of, e of evil in the world, and uh, one is uh, criminal level evil that we all s sort of, you know, like, oh, I'd love to have more stuff. If I was to steal stuff, I'd have more stuff, and sort of we get that criminals do stuff that we kind of understand that they're just achieving, you know, gaining power or sex or money or whatever. It is. Societal level evil isn't in fact like that. But what people want to do for societal level, and I mean the large scale events that lead to great crimes, um, of course, there's some smattering of criminal level behavior. Someone might be doing CYA or covering things up. Um, but for the most part, it's not driven by that. It's driven by well-intentioned large groups who right. act in unison in various kinds of ways, and they're truly well-intentioned. Um, but people don't get that because they're not used to a normal life thinking about that way. So when they look for who could have done all of these things that seem to be that they're all coordinated, right? right. But the problem is that this kind of seeming coordination, there's their natural reaction is saying, if it's seeming coordination, there has to be a coordinator. And these people are the criminals. They, they're like criminal level behavior that we all understand. They're doing it for more money, for more power, or for you know, greed kinds of reasons. That is not what's happening at these, at these scales. What hap the reason that you have seeming coordination the only way you can get seeming coordination at these scales is through emergent phenomena. You can't possibly get these kinds of coordinated activities from multiple, you know, from dozens and dozens of government, millions, billions of folks all beating as one that we have to do zero COVID. We have to, this doesn't happen right. by virtue of a centralized cabal. And pe but the regular, normal human way of thinking, unless you've spent years thinking about emergent phenomena and uh, evolutionary kinds of selection processes, these are not simple things that you have intuitions for. Instead, you're just saying, oh, there's a cabal that must have done this. Right? right. So I'm constantly arguing, in addition to arguing against the lockdowners and the authoritarians, I'm trying to argue against my own side 
who in struggling, using your normal intuitions for what the heck could have done this, they're grasping at right. um, uh, uh, these, these kinds of theories, um, none of which are in fact real. Now, they're really, right. there are lots of bad guys. They're all leveraging the situ- situation. They're not bad guys in the sense that they're purposely doing evil you know, in their, by their own intent, right. but they're utilizing the situation because they think that the world would be better if we had more centralized control, the world would be better if we censor, you know, censored misinformation. Right. And they all think that, that doing the, that would make a better world. And they're wrong and they're evil for doing that because they're violating right. certain principles that you have to follow to be a good person. So these are the kinds of things that I'm often arguing against. But there is no centralized cabal that has had right. this plan for 20 years. And that's a deep right. kind of human fallacy to think so. And so that's just, it's basically just our brains trying to form a construct of, of of rationalizing what's happening and trying to blame it on one source when it's probably, you know, hundreds of different sources and everyone's taking advantage of a situation. That's right. And it's like, it's a, it's like a Ouija board. Right. Or it's like Bitcoin. But like another thing, way to, uh, intuition is Ouija board. Even with four people playing Ouija board, you've got, you know, eight hands when you're playing Ouija board. It's a little spooky sometimes, especially you get in that mood that you're communicating with some dead person. But you often right. don't really have... No, you know, some like sometimes maybe one person sort of takes is a little bit bossy, and they might make it. But usually, no one's being bossy when it works well. Right. But imagine you've got a million hands of varying sizes. Some are pushier hands, is like the WHO, and some are you know, there's all different. But it's all happening at once. Um, it's you. You're still just like when we play Ouija board, going to imagine that oh, it was this you know, it was this dead guy that he was actually moving it. That's what you right. want to be able to say. There's some, but it wasn't right. Right, right. And so I'm guessing it's, you know, in a roundabout way, the answer to that is that there is no, they have no moral standing. Like, even if that, theory, that hy- you know, hypothetical that I, I said earlier, even in that case, it's not right. They, it, they, we have civil liberties. Is they, that, what, that what you're saying? There's no oh, yeah, instance yeah, where. Sure. Because oh, it's yeah, like, they, 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 it, oh, right. Well, let, yeah. let me, let me ask even it a little more globally. Sure. Doesn't, they're, they're wrong. Yeah. Which but, is, there's this new phenomenon I have seen and uh, have been subjected to. That sort of I, I uh, sort of put under the title of you can't handle the truth. Uh, you know, you're not allowed. You how dare you platform somebody? How dare you speak to that person? How dare you allow them to to give their opinion? This 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 is the craziest thing I've in my of my lifetime. This is the number one crazy thing that I I've seen through COVID, which is this this feeling that because I don't agree with or like what somebody is saying. They must be silenced. Anybody that speaks to them should be silenced. Anybody that talks, to them, it's just the oddest thing in the world to me. But it sort of goes under the 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 intuition of people can't handle the truth. What is that? Where'd that come from? Do you have any idea? Well, I mean, this isn't new, right? I mean, even in college, I remember um, you know conservative speakers were coming and they were being shouted down. This is 1988, right? This is a long history, and of course, it ramped up. It got worse in the 2000s. 2000s and 2000. We've seen this for a long time. What people seem to think is that it's a privilege to let somebody speak. It isn't a privilege to speak. It is. It is. Uh, you are putting reputation at stake. It's. 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 You're. You're put, potentially putting yourself at risk when you speak. Um, so, for example, suppose that I don't like you, and we're playing poker, and you come up and ask to play. But I say, no, I don't, I don't want you to play. No, I might want to play because I want to take your money because I don't like you. And this is what happens in the debates and discussions in the public square when there are folks that I disagree with and I think I'm right and I think I can argue them under the table. I want them to come onto the playing field because I'm going to be able to right. show everybody how wrong they are. They will lose social reputation. Those chips will come over to me. I will take them. Right? You, it is a liability. To, to have free speech is a liability. You are risking social capital every time you speak. In fact, our emotional expressions evolved for this. The more that I'm confident when I'm arguing with you or the more that I'm disdainful of your, you know, of how confident you claim to be. I say, no, you're not. Both of those push more chips on the table so that if it turns out that I'm wrong, I lose a lot more. If instead I'm not very, mm. you know, I show humility. I'm not really sure, Dr. Drew, or I say like, you're, you seem to be making a really good point. So maybe you're right. Then if it turns out you're right, I'm not going to lose that much. All of our emotional expressions are all about modulating this kind of poker game that we're playing with social capital. So you don't want to stop people that you disagree with from speaking. You want to use this as an opportunity to humiliate them, right? This is what I just did a science moment last week, just two days ago. Cancellation versus humiliation. 
It kind of feels like a similar kind of thing, but it's not. Cancellation is about taking someone's voice out of the public square. You're trying to prevent that voice or that idea from ever being discussed. Humiliation, suppose that I win an argument with you, I want that argument and my counter argument to be everywhere because I, the only way that I, he can really lose reputation and me gain it is that everybody across the network has to know. Otherwise, it's just some secret you know, on DMs, right? Humiliation is consistent. In fact, it's part and parcel. Uh, it's part of the very functioning of free expression and how it moves towards the truth. We need these reputations to rise and fall in a functioning manner. That's how free expression works. And humiliation, on the other side, glory of having won, been right, right? Are, are, are key parts of that mechanism. So why would you want to stop your enemies from speaking? You want them to humiliate themselves. Humiliation does not feel as uh, crowd-like, crowd-satisfying. Uh, cancellation is more scapegoating, guillotines, silencing, heads on spikes. That's more crowd behavior. Humiliation feels a little more, although it's humiliation before the crowd, the humiliation has to be done by someone. The humiliating right. argument, the humiliating. So it's 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 a little different. And I feel like we've been in this thing where the gratification of being part of these out of control, mad crowds has been part of the story. And so cancellation becomes more gratifying and certainly easier. You just sweep into yeah, the think, crowd. Right. It, I, I think you're right. But don't underestimate the power of humiliation. I, I agree. It's not like usually it's not a crowd winning an argument against a single individual per se. It's usually more mano yeah. a mano. Um, but crowds love this is what gossip is all about. The only reason you gossip with people is to figure out who raised and lowered in some very abstract sense, who raised and who lowered in reputation this week amongst your friends. And you're gossiping constantly about that because you're always keep trying to keep track. Instinctually, you want to keep track of whose reputations went up and down. Um, when there's a boxing match or a, a mixed martial arts match, they put the two fighters on stage and they each know we need to start trash talking in front of a crowd. We need to look like we hate each other. We, know, we don't want to say, oh, I'm going to have a fight and I really respect him. Oh, I'm going to fight and I really respect him. No, they want to see that they trash talk each other. They either were overly confident or overly disdainful. So now you can just, all these chips just got piled up onto the table, right? And now people are excited. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, someone's going to lose all these chips. They're going to be so humiliated. That's why we watch. In fact, we're willing to even just listen to the radio just because we want that moment when we go, oh man, he, oh yeah, he, oh, well, that's so humiliating, right? Or, you know, embarrassing or, oh mm -hmm. man, that sucks, you know, face or whatever the kinds of things we say. If we relish in watching those chips get pushed off the table from one, uh, from, you know, off the table to one side. A, a couple of fact, times you've yeah. glossed past the, the, the idea that uh, the, the, the uh, emergent system phenomenon is not a common intuition that people have and that it's to describe it as computationally difficult. I, could you give us a little more so we can develop some intuition for that? Well, uh, I mean, about which part in particular? Uh, I, I think I could talk a little bit more about how, why these narratives, social narratives are, are blockchain-like, but let me just give you a couple, you know, a couple similarities. One way that blockchains work in some sense, so that you've got all this history of all the transactions, and then there's some new transactions today, and it has to be decided which transactions are sort of correct um, and then get added to the existing blockchain. And one way to ensure that people are not being funny about it is that th there's a voting kind of process, and it's called proof of stake. Those who own more Bitcoin, say, have a greater vote in terms of whether this is a truthful new uh, sequence of things or transactions that occurred this week. Well, proof of, of, of stake is just like being in a, in a, um, in a, in a, um, a tribe, and those who have higher reputation are the ones that you're more likely to believe in terms of what happened in terms of the last day, in terms of who raised and who lowered in social, you know, in social capital. You're more likely to trust them than the person that has no reputation. So they have a bigger vote in some sense about what really happened. You go, oh, okay, I trust them. So now I realize that Doug lowered in reputation. Similar kinds of processes. There's another process that happens in blockchain is called proof of work. 
and it, in some sense, the, the, the group that wants to add the new sequence of transactions that occurred today or whatever has to do a whole computationally difficult task before they're allowed to do it. It's really computationally difficult, but it's really easy to tell that they've done it. Well, this is the same thing. We have people in communities and tribes that are the gossip queens or kings. They're just so good at, at creating stories that summarize not only what happened this week, but sort of connects it up to past things and makes it super explanatory. So like, oh, I get it. Yeah, that just, well, that's what he always does. Oh, that's because he once did like Susie. And so because of that, that totally explains it. They come up with these sort of spin narratives that make it a lot easier to remember. And it's really hard to do coming up with highly elegant explanations that add the new gossip to the old gossip chain. But it's really easy to tell when it's done well, because you go, oh, I get it. Right? You can really tell how easy it is, is to do. So it has the same kinds of mathematical properties in this, in this way, as does proof of work. So this is just a couple examples as to how that leads to these social narratives that are highly stable, highly impervious, impervious to being mucked with. Um, and that's good because you don't want people to be able to lie about their reputation, but it can also be bad when you have an ill narrative uh, take shape. Caleb, I know you were very excited about Mark coming in today. I wonder if you have other questions. Yes. Yeah, I actually do. I I was just so impressed by going back on your tweets from 2020 and seeing that you've been saying this stuff from pretty much day one. Uh, my, I have, I'm just trying to think of where to begin with my questions. I'm thinking about, so I grew up in a very religious household. Everything was black and white. It was good or evil, and that was it. There's nothing in between. But then when I got older and I, I left the farm and I started meeting more people, I found that uh, what most people know, everything is a spectrum. And if we actually want to change things in humanity, literally, it's, literally right, left literally, the farm, literally left the farm, <laughs> literally <laughs> moved from the farm to Los Angeles. And now I moved back <laughs> South. So I spent, you know, 20 years in one, 10 years in the other. So I, I've seen both sides of this, but it's the thing that I've, I've found is that if we want to make changes to humanity and instead of yelling all these talking points back and forth, then the vital thing is for us to step into the shoes of our opposition and assume that their intentions are good and then try and fight their distorted worldviews by challenging them on the same ground. And so uh, right now, though, that just kind of feels impossible in a way because everyone is just fighting from this place of constant anxiety and fear. Like I think about, you know, uh, transgender people, they don't want to go back to being beaten in the streets, so they're not going to budge an inch about bathrooms immunocompromised people. They don't want to go back to being stuck indoors all the time. So they want society to keep masking. Conservatives think that if we you know, allow abortions for rape victims today, then tomorrow there'll be abortions at nine months when the other side isn't even asking for any of those things, but everyone is acting like people are intentionally evil and must be stopped always at whatever cost. So how do we approach these really complicated minefield topics without the conversation just blowing up all the time? Yeah, I mean, uh, a great question. I mean, uh, I certainly try my best to do that. Uh, the way that I feel like, to the extent that I feel like I've done better than some that I see around me is that I've always tried to remain, again, aloof. I've tried not to, sometimes where I see the greatest anger are the folks that have decided that they are on the right. And they identify as on the right, or they identify as a Trumper or, the, or as a DeSantis person. And right now on the right, they're constantly like basically throwing little Molotov cocktails at each other constantly. They like hate each other, right? Right. I was like, I, I've never gotten to the point where I'm on left or right, much less within the right. You know, and right now I'm more associated with the right because they happen to be on the, you know, on the liberty side on this COVID stuff. Right. So I, I just it's kind of uh, having a, a level of aloofness. So I'm hated by the left because that's associated with the lockdowners. But now I'm hated by the right because, and I'm sure there's tons of people, oh, Mark, he's a total shill because he doesn't think that, and there's 12 different pandemic kind of these crazy ideas. They're all different, but right. you know, they're all of these. He doesn't believe there's a centralized cabal. He's controlled opposition, right? And so they right. hate me as well. And, so, and I, you know, I, I'm, I'm more pro-choice or like I'm not really either. I think it's, I don't know, eight weeks, somewhere around there. I don't know what the right, it's a fuzzy. There's no way, to, there, there's no right. right thing. It ain't one day and it ain't eight, eight, it ain't eight and a half months either. And um, so I, I'm not really either. Uh, so trying to maintain yourself uh, out from these righteous groups allows you, I believe, to keep a clear head and uh, you then can be hated by everybody. 
Right. And, but how do you have <laughs> that? <necessary. laughs> true. True. Right. I mean, I'm that just, is actually, I, there's some truth to this. Yeah. <laughs> That's, it's true. I mean, I, I guess it's if you're going to be correct, you're going to be hated by half and half of both sides, the yeah. half extremes of both sides. So you're in somewhere in the middle. That seems to be the problem a lot with this show as well, is that Drew has very nuanced views. Both sides don't like that. The extreme and loud right. people on both sides do not like that. And something that I've learned after my wife actually taught me this, I've learned some things after being with her for almost over a decade now. And it is that uh, whenever somebody is needs to calm down, the worst thing you can tell them is to calm down because that's just going to <laughs> even more. That's the worst possible thing you can do. And so I just think about all of these people that are in these groups here that they always, it seems like they're so incensed, like they're just, and I feel like it's an anxiety trigger where they're so afraid of going back to being beaten in the streets or having to go back in the closet or having to hide that they're kind of ignoring elements in their own communities that they don't even want to be associated with, but they just don't want to give up those rights because they're so afraid that someone's going to come and take them. And I, I can I can understand that, but I also understand someone's personal freedom. Like I, I have Crohn's disease. I, it would help me a lot if everyone in the world wore masks. I'm not going to, I would never expect anyone to wear a mask because that's their well, right. I take on work. the risk supposing of my own problem. Work. Well, yeah, supposing they worked, you know, oh, even okay. if they did, you know, but it's, right. yeah, that's where I start to think, well, how am I going to have these conversations with my friends? Because I, I have, I have friends who are very, very rational transgender friends of mine that I, you know, it's, I, I've known for many, many years that want to distance themselves from the current movement and what's happening now, because they think we are going to lose all of the rights that we've fought for because everybody is giving the microphone to these, this small group of crazy people that just keep yelling right. really loud when most of them just want to be left alone. Like people just want to be left right. alone to be free to do what they want. And it's, it's difficult to have a conversation because if you bring up any nuance of a slight restriction or a, anything there, it almost seems like I can understand why they get so upset because if you voice taking one inch of a right away from someone that's fought for decades just to get there, they're going to be afraid of losing all of it. They're going to afraid the whole house of cards is going to come tumbling down. So it's a, I don't even know where that's what I guess what I'm asking is like, how do you have these, this, these minefield conversations without blowing it all up? Yeah. I, yeah, I'm, I'm a little flat footed on that particular question. Although in some sense I'm involved in this, in daily on Twitter, but I haven't really uh, encapsulated a nice a suite of principles. But I'll tell you one thing that is helpful as a classical liberal libertarian, as opposed to utilitarian. I libertarianism is almost nothing, right? It that central core, that kernel, it just says don't violate other people's civil liberties, or just don't attack anybody unless you're being attacked. You know, just, and I get how to flush that out is all these complexities. You can argue, you know, argue for years about these sorts of things, but it's super small. Now, I also can be utilitarian subject to that libertarianism and say, I think you should, let's say, raise the utility subject to not violating civil liberties. But when I just have that core, I don't really get into fights with most people because the other stuff is a little bit secondary. But a lot of people who have a full right. utility, I think you should so, you know, I've got this ingenious scheme, and I think the world should follow my ingenious scheme. And someone else, well, I've got this other ingenious scheme, and I think that would make a better world. We have, I have different standards for what my schemes are, and different ways right. of implementing, it, or the same standards but different ways of. And so now, because utilitarianism has an opinion on every damned thing, right? <laughs> By necessity, consequentialism or utilitarianism has an opinion on everything. Right. So you're going to be arguing about every single thing. You just can't be relaxed. So if you want, you know, having a laissez-faire philosophy like classical liberalism allows you to be laissez-faire, that's great. Okay, you want to do that? I don't really get it, whatever. But right. fine, I don't care. Just do it. And I think that kind of staying aloof and then having a philosophy that's inherently justifiable, in my opinion, but also just keeps you aloof and not giving a damn is the best way for people to um, get along. Yeah. Right, right. Well, for sure, the 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 ev that's the evidence. But I... I, again, I, I keep seeing this strange grandiosity. The, the I care is a grandiose statement. The you, you know, you, you to, to give a, to care at all about what you think or what you can tolerate or, you know, what, I mean, it's, 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 it's all very grandiose. Uh, and it, it's grandiose to want to tell people how to live their life. I, the part that the most mysterious part to me is the people that want to, the power the authorities to tell them what to do when people sort of are gratified by that i, I that's confusing to me but uh but the, there's something else <clears throat> you you're, you know you've said there's no preconditions for any of this it's just in the human uh sort of 
system at least the cognitive system uh, but i don't know that this this feels like that this is a little different thing do, do you know what i'm talking about mark at all I, I i'm not convinced that it's that it's qualitatively different than uh all of the other sorts of things like this that have occurred i think there's always different icing in each of these and people have trouble often seeing past the icing in fact you know i'm i'm half iranian my wife is iranian my dad's iranian and the iranian community in america has gone through this kind of thing they went through the islamic revolution where women you know in the 1970s were you know just in bikinis on and walking around in western attire and 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 then two or three years later suddenly uh this kind of new cultural norms and norm, norm, notions of righteousness and it being uh, 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 uh policed on the street by regular people and of course and occasionally it's sort of the military uh, the the secret police or whatever but just the people on the street are, are after you constantly encouraging and enforcing these kinds of edicts, right? So you might say, ah, oh, I've seen totalitarianism. I've seen a rise, a sudden rise of this new narrative of this new righteous thing and seen suddenly everybody lose their rights. But when, they, when COVID happened, there was zero difference between this community and there's other communities you can point to you know, around too that have experienced their own. But when it was a new uh, collective madness of, a, of a, it leading to a different kind of righteous notion. It was as if they had no uh, learning curve from the one that they had already experienced. So I think it just ends up feeling different. The, the icing seems to hide it, um, especially if you are in it, right? They themselves fell in it. They were all, you know, just, you can't come to the party. My wife got kicked out of a particular group because she refused to get vaccinated. And she was no, you know, she was persona non grata, right? This, they were engaging in all the kinds of behaviors they would have, uh, they left Iran for. Okay. So I want to make sure, I want to hang a little lantern on that and put a little light to it, is that you're saying that you've seen the mass formation develop spontaneously as an emergent phenomenon in your country of origin. And you came here, as many Iranians did, having witnessed that. And in spite of that, you did once the cooties and the disgust and the fear was triggered, you lose that insight and suddenly it happens all over again. Would that be about it? Happens a, all over again. I can yeah, really say right. it. And I, yeah. yeah. And I, of course, they themselves probably didn't fall in the first one very strongly because they, they're, the, they're the folks that left, but they fell right. fully in this one. And they're, of course, unable to see the kinds of things that we're talking about at all. In fact, anyone who like, who's like that watching was a lockdowner probably doesn't even understand what we're talking about. Right. They just think it's gobbledygook. They go, "What are you talking now, about?" Is that is that cognitive dissonance? Is that some cognitive distortion? Is that how do we understand that? I think the, you have this is cognitive dissonance is like a minor version of this, where I built up my own personal narrative for Mark about why I did what I did, and I really did it for that, whatever. But uh, in communities, it's like cognitive dissonance on crack because it's not justified mm. by just me coming up with my own justifications. It's done by potentially millions of people and much brighter people than me. And it doesn't even matter whether they're brighter, but selecting through all of these different kinds of ideas, suddenly some really cool idea pops up, is selected for, like the free market of ideas. And that really justifies all the things that we've been doing so far and says, yeah, the reasons we did all these things was because in some really elegant, beautiful kind of argument that then gets added to the narrative and is much smarter and provides much better justification than what any individual could do alone. So it's sort of a- Do you imagine we're going- Collective distance, yeah. Do you imagine we're- do you, do you imagine we're going to see some smart uh, phenomenon or thoughts or ideas emerge that then become part of a new emergent process in the near term? I mean, they're constantly happening, right? This is an ongoing. The, the, once you it, once you are are thinking about the worst way, you'll see it at small scales. Again, the Lululemon ladies in your city versus, let's say, the really fancy dressing up all the time whores about the lululemon ladies or whatever all scales small scales large scales you see these things time and they're happening on the right and they're happening on the left i feel like they're happening more on the left um but i think that could change you know over time so i, I don't think that there's the to the extent that there's qualitative uh uh cases that we notice is that they're disproportionately large right and disproportionately large ones are due to sort of really rare moments of virality where these new memes spread and bounce and become added. And that's super rare, but at all scales, you'll see them um, as, as you start to, to pay attention to them. 
I, I'm going to ask the question though again though are you imagining that there will be some things that happen at scale that will move us in a better direction perhaps is what I'm asking uh, uh no I don't think so I would love to see that suddenly there's some you know meme that passes through uh that really uh sort of creates almost a hysteria for civil liberties and freedom and pushing back on these kinds of irrational ideas um in some sense this is Things like that are like a the trillion dollar question. Is there ways of, of structuring society freely, structuring society, or doing things that can uh, motivate or make more probable uh, memes that are, go are going in the right direction in terms of freedom? So those are the kind of things that we, that we think about at, at the free expression group, freex.group, is how to understand these kinds of phenomena at scale. And are there ways of potentially making tweaks here and there freely without any you know, without any authoritarianism that could help encourage these sorts of mechanisms in the right way so that they're not prone to becoming ill like they were in March of 2020. And is it your experience in uh, the Iranian revolution that uh, made you a libertarian? Uh, no, I don't, I don't think so. But I, I do have to say that one of my first experiences with collective hysteria was being an Iranian. You know, I was, uh, 1979, I was 10 years old, and the revolution happened. And suddenly, uh, it used to be Persian Iranian rug stores, Iranian carpet stores. You know, it was, that was everywhere. The next day, they all became Persian because the thought was like, Americans don't really know what Persian, and they don't realize that Persian is the same thing as Iranian. So a lot of them switched to Persian. They went with the word Persian, which was sort of different sounding. And my parents came to me and said, Mark, you're not Iranian anymore. You're Persian, if they ask. And every night on TV, everywhere that you would watch, Iran was the enemy of America. And to this day, that narrative notice mm. is still there. It hasn't budged. I mean, yeah. the mullahs have no credit for why it should have changed. But nevertheless, it is strongly there. No one even knew what Iran really was in 1978. Seriously, the average person would have had no idea what Iran was. Today, whether they know much about it, they know it's the enemy of the United States. Right? And so I saw that behavior change, that sudden gestalt. Iran is now an enemy, and it, it, it that's just part of the, the the social narrative of the West, or at least the United States, since then. I remember back in those days, we knew we knew the Shah. Everyone knew the Shah of Iran. Yeah, that's right. Which was no, yeah. <laughs> which was no picnic, but um, you know, right? I'm sure. Either, but yeah, right. Uh, Susan, anything? Questions on your front? Has anybody told you you look like George Clooney? Oh, well, that's good. That's a nice, uh, uh, I nice think that compliment. If you're, if you're, yeah, but if you're young, every guy that's sort of in his fifties or sixties and uh, a little bit of white, they all look like the same guy. And if you get a little, if you're chubby at that age, you know, then you're you're, you're Santa. So I think that just it just shows that, <laughs> that we all become the same person. You know? That's hysterical, Caleb. I want to give you last uh, chance too. Uh, Mike, my, my other questions are, are very long, so we'll have to bring him back. <laughs> I, have, I have a bunch of other, yeah, can, I can, just, I was so impressed just clicking on there. I'm like, wow, this is, it's on the record here. You saying in March of 2020, predicting exactly what was going to happen and nobody listened. And I wish they had, you were spot on. I think Drew said the same thing. <laughs> uh, who said the same thing? I did. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Of yeah. Course. That, I, spot I mean, on. Yeah. Anybody, anybody who stood back, I, I though, what I got a couple things wrong. I, it looked to me at the time, like the press was trying to create the hysteria, like they were driving it and they were, in, they were insistent upon it. I mean, New York times, we know that's true now, New York times editorial board demanding lockdowns. Why do they even have a place at the table? When do they suddenly right. experts in non-pharmacological intervention in medicine? Why, why do we, why did anybody listen to them? And it was constant, right. constant, constant. Oh, there's no question. Yeah. If I if I hear if I hear words again, like what were those words they used? Uh, staggering, staggering numbers. Eight people sick. Staggering, staggering, and then. Uh, <laughs> God, what was the yeah, other word? Yeah, but they're not counting all the people who are dying from the vaccine. Mark, did you get canceled on Twitter? Back then. Oh, yeah, I was uh, treated they, as sensitive get... content for, well, I was I was suspended for six or seven times. I was permanently suspended once, brought back in, and then I was sensitive content. All my tweets just said, this is sensitive content. You have to change your settings 
And then once you change your settings to allowing that, then any porn or whatever starts to be. So most people were unwilling to do it. Ugh. So for a year and a half, I was or almost <laughs> oh two years, God. I was sensitive to content. And all my impressions crashed to Ugh. zero, you know, almost zero for that time. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the media has its, has its role. But remember, these things are, are loops. Um, uh, the media frightens the people, which demand action by the politicians, which demand action, which the reporters are, are, are hyping, which scares the people. And it, these things just go in loops and loops. And if you go all the way to the back to the beginning, it's just like an avalanche. An avalanche, you could throw one little micro dot that starts and hits something, which hits something else. Which, the, the dot, that there's no cause. There's no one cause. The cause is that the mountain... Uh, the conditions of the friction of the mountain or the, you know, the density of the rocks. These are the kinds of things you have to talk about to understand really what's going on. And it's inherently a holistic kind of description, not a billiard ball one. Let me get one quick question from uh, the audience here on Twitter spaces. I give David a chance to come up and uh, do unmute your mic there, David. Hi there. Thanks so much for giving us a, a chance to jump up. Um, I, I just wanted to point out a couple of things, if that's all right. Um, I'm a social scientist. I'm not mm -hmm. radically left-leaning. I, I went back to university because I recognized there was something going on. Um, I'm ex-armed forces as well, uh, NBC trained, nuclear, biological, and chemical warfare trained. So COVID was uh, concerning for me. But my whole family are either work in the NHS or they're vulnerable um, so I encouraged them to take it, but I didn't take the, the jab myself uh, just because um, the British Medical Journal and the Lancet, uh, obviously, they produced those papers that said that anyone believe, who believed in the Wuhan origin theory was a far right conspiracy theorist. And as soon as that happened, I knew something was up. These are the oldest journals in the world. Uh, they, they should not be getting involved in political discussions like that. Uh, anyway, my. Uh, yeah, I, I, my own research was focusing on Marxism in relation to how that affects domestic violence literature uh, at the time. And it's taken me down this horrible rabbit hole, but I won't go too far into that. But what I will say is that Klaus Schwab, uh, his second ever WEF conference, um, he had to sneak Paolo Freire in because it was still illegal for Marxists to talk to crowds in public in Europe at the time. Um, so he had, had to sneak him in to be able to talk at the conference. And that obviously stands out um, uh, massively, um, especially when we consider what's going on in the schools at the moment with the conscientization process, you know, turning our kids into the revolutionary guard. Now, um, the, the thing about COVID is it does worry me. Um, it is a, um, a sp supposedly world-ending technology, um, and we have just had this um, uh, variant prop up recently that is highly mutational, which isn't un uh, unheard of. You know, the flu, uh, flu mutates 25 times a year, standard flu, uh, and COVID tends to um, mutate 15 times a year. So it's not unusual, but I'm still worried about whether this highly mutational version Version, will cross over to the animal kingdom, mutate with something over there, and then come back over the, the barrier that normally keeps us safe, and then we're all screwed. That's my fear. Um, but going to what you were saying there about what uh, how everyone reacted, being as there is this overlap with this Marxist ideology, it occurred to me that all that the uh, wearing the masks thing ever did was separate people into two groups, into conformist and yep. non-conformist. And the nonconformist intelligentsia are always the first to die in a cultural revolution. And now we're in a cultural revolution. So I, I wondered what you thought about that. Mark? Well, uh, uh, definitely the, the um, uh, masks and, and a vaccine became uh, sort of proofs, of uh, political purity tests to get into anywhere, right? They were membership signals and, and eventually sort of evolved to be virtuous or, or good in themselves, but they also served as political purity tests. And so um, a lot of, you know, the idea that these things, I mean, doesn't mean that the individuals enforcing them at the restaurants or wherever it might be, were thinking to themselves, oh, we're doing a purity test and this way it keeps the Trumpers or whatever out, but it's being selected for in part because it serves as a political purity test. And these are one of the many reasons, but especially strong one for why it gets selected for and encouraged within the communities. And so, yeah, all we're doing is keeping out, uh, again, they're not, no one's saying this, but the whole network is in some sense is saying this at the holistic level. It serves as a purity test to isolate and identify the unclean. 
And I, I think, though, and thank you, Dave, for the question, that, that he was sort of making kind of a Maoist argument there, that the the nonconformist, the elite, the non intelligent nonconformists are the ones that get taken out first. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not, I, I would imagine that that sort of, uh, strategy is, you know, goes way back long before uh, uh, Maoism and communism. It's just sort of a, 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 a smart sort of strategy. I'm, uh, uh, as an aside, I'm a lot of people keep calling the lockdowners communists and all these. To me, all of this has is a completely different icing. Of course, it has still some fundamental similarities as all of these kinds of uh, righteous movements that want to in, uh, implement their ingenious scheme to save the world. But there's lots of different righteous movements that want to in, implement their ingenious scheme to save the world. And they're not all communism, right? The flavor in the, of, of what has been going on with lockdowns has completely different kinds of particulars that make it totally unlike communism. Nowhere in all of this have people ever said, you know, from each to his means to all anyone to, you know, as their, their needs or whatever that, that phrase right. is. It's, it's totally right. a different kind of argument. Um, it's not about everybody should have equal income. It's just a completely different animal, right? It's, it still has un yeah. underpinnings, which are still psycho, psycho societally similar. But there's a, a, I mean, the right has battled socialism and communism for sort of 40 years and sort of can't stop saying communists when it's their, when it's their righteous enemy. But it's not that in this case, right? In fact, at the start in March, March 10th or March 10th or so of 2020, the only people that I could find that agreed with me were capital C communists on Twitter. These were like serious communists, but they said like, you can't pause an economy. You know, they, they have a, they're really worried about, you know, whether they're messing up an economy because they're constantly accused of never being able to run an economy. And of course they can't because they're trying to centrally organize it, but it's really on their, you know, thinking about it. We don't want to suppose it because we can barely even think about running it. We're just going to have cheese lines, et cetera. Right. So they got it. These, you know, communists. So there's a lot of communists and a lot of people that were on the left and historically would have been very strongly socialist. They identified with socialism their whole life. And now they are anti-lockdowners because of what they saw. And so I don't think that communism, socialism is a way to think about this at all. I'd like to leave this right here. I particularly like the idea that it's the righteous schemes to save the world. I, I was saying, uh, it, to me, this thing smacked of what I saw happen during the opioid crisis, which was there were these physicians who were on the righteous path to eliminate pain in america there should never be pain they literally described themselves as wearing a white hat and they saw the drug companies as the perfect allies in this fight to righteousness and then they enlisted all the regulatory organizations and the licensing organizations and the supervisory organizations and the va and the hospitals and that's how we got the opioid crisis that's how it happened and when i saw deborah burks running around the world like a christian evangelist she was not a religious evangelist she was a medical evangelist i thought oh my god it's the same playbook it's the same thing and you're saying it's not so much a playbook is that these people are around all the time that everyone has a righteous scheme to save the world and if the right as you say the right uh what do you call it a dot that triggers the avalanche develops they're off and running is that a fair way to to uh frame all this yeah and, and by they it, it can mean a whole community um uh, uh, creating feedback around itself and they all are sort of bouncing yeah. at one and they uh, it, believe that I, yeah. they're doing right. Yeah. Yeah. They're that, doing that, God's that, work. That, they're saving the world. Yeah. But they're evil. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it will, I don't know that they're Mark, evil. You know, it's yeah. go ahead. A lot of people say, Mark, you're saying that they're well-intentioned. Why are you defending them? Like, no communities always evolve justifications for why what they do is ethically justified always it's like a tautology yeah. it is no defense yeah. to say of your opponent that they are well-intentioned that almost it only happens in criminal level behavior it never doesn't happen in righteous communities they always believe they're well-intentioned it is no defense um so yeah and i i'd rather i think and people won't push back as hard if perhaps you were to say that's how evil happens they may not be evil but they managed to do evil things in the in the in the right. course uh, of this. I'm, and uh, what? 
And what uh, Caleb, what Mark just said, please put that on a clip and let's push that out on Twitter, <laughs> on X, whatever it is. <laughs> because that's, I really feel like that's that's a core principle that I'm walking away with today that I will never forget. Mark, thank you again. Thank you for coming back. Uh, it's uh, changizi.com, C-H-A-N-G-I-Z-I. Uh, Expressly Human is his latest book. Uh, do you want to push people to the uh, YouTube and the, and the um, X Society? Yeah, so just Mark Changizi, all one word at Twitter, and uh, same for YouTube and Rumble. And yep. Oh, all also right. I have Loof Wired. I started a magazine. Co- yeah, Loof Wired, like being aloof. A lot of this is about being aloof, but just Loof L O O F Wired dot com. Uh, trying to take on Siam and Discover Magazine and Wired that have really failed us as uh, as outlets. Great, thank you, my friend. I hopefully, see you very soon. Well done. And uh, for the rest of you, we will be back on Tuesday at three o'clock. I think Dr. Victory is joining us. Is that correct? There we are. Uh, Jeffrey Tucker. That's right. And September 6th, we're going to be early with Joseph Freeman. Uh, I do strongly urge you to listen to that conversation. He also has had several extraordinary insights that he brought us. And uh, Candace Owens coming in on September 19th. We have more to fill in there for you, but uh, look forward to next Tuesday and Thursday. Tuesday is 3 o'clock with Dr. Victory and Jeffrey Tucker. Next Wednesday is, is uh, noon Pacific time with uh, Joseph Fryman and also Kelly, uh, Kelly Victory. So until Tuesday, have a nice weekend, everybody. Have a nice Labor Day, and we'll see you on the other side. Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor, and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800 273-8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com slash help. Uh, anything I can do to increase my load side? How many times have we had this this question? (laughs) I have a 30 year old healthy male. Uh, even when I don't a day or two, I shoot pathetic small loads. Is there anything I do to increase it or just have to accept it? Thanks. Piss on me. Beat me. Bet I'll be coming up in May. Hydration, uh, levels of stimulation, you know, little prolonged stimulation, delayed ejection. All these things could increase it somewhat, but as I've explained many, many times, really as much as anything, it's the the size, the volume that is stored in the in the um, not in the balls, in the liver, not in the liver. You make I don't know why in I'm the, the name of this. Show me the, the pro- epididymis. No, epididymitis. Show me the prostate and testes. Uh, just the vasi defes. No, no, just get me a. Uh, there it is. Yeah, the semi vesis. No, to the right. Yep. There we are. The um, seminal ve- seminal vesicles. Yeah, the, the semi vesis. Oh, okay, semi vesis. Yeah. I thought you said the vas- vasi defies or something. I mean, we said that too. Yeah, I mean, okay. we were shooting our shot ropes, shooting our loads. 